Girls. Dr. John DeBarge, who's in this slide here, and his research team from the University of Waterloo, put radio collars on wolves and tracked them to see where they go. What they found was that the population of wolves in the park was declining and was threatened to be endangered. So what the researchers found that as the wolves followed deer, their favorite food in the wintertime, outside of the park to a deer wintering yard, a place where there's more vegetation and browse for the deer, they were being killed because some people didn't like the fact that they ate deer or were scared of them. All these different fears we have of the wolf. Does Bob, has he ever seen any wolves around his property here? Oh yeah, lots here. Yeah. Uh, or this year, no, this year was good. Yeah. So right along the tree line, or they just come right out in the Oh, they open. come right out in the open field. Eh? Yeah. What, what, what does he have here? I notice he has some cattle. Anything else? Horses? No, what? Just cattle. Just cattle. Yeah. Yeah, that, that deer is coming back. I don't know, is it? I think it's going away. I can't tell what it is. It is, it's... Do you see that deer? Chase him and just run right into That's it. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, cause, cause they're skimming the ground. Right? Yeah. Now that one deer that I've told you that went through the fence. I mean, the the hind leg. The deer jumped over, but the hind leg went here, yeah. and then it hung up. Right? Yeah. That was the end on the end of that field there, and that's where the wolves got it. Most deer I've ever seen in one place outside of a zoo. <laughs> Right, eh? Yeah, I think so. Well, the, Look, there's more coming there. But, uh, you know, getting back with this in the wild, in the wild. I mean, you were there and I was there when that wolf got that deer at, uh, oh, uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Yankus. Yeah. She's got white siding on the house. There was blood on the white siding of the house because the wolf was after that deer and the, it had ripped the deer and stuff to the deer wood right beside the house. Same at uh, Dale Wisniewski. Another deer right at the house. You know, and I mean, the ministry said, well, that's in the wild. It's not in the wild. Come on. You know. That happened the same night. Yeah. The yeah, two yeah. deer, the same night. Yeah. Like, at Dale Vesneski's, you could look out the kitchen window like this, and there, the deer was right there. <laughs> yeah. Where we're going to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no. Yeah. yeah. I get the idea, yeah. And I mean, and I mean, this was the ministry said. Well, it happens. It's in the wild. Well, it's not in the wild. I mean, these people have kids there, children. You know, could it have been a, ch a ch child there being attacked? Who knows, eh? I worked in Algonquin Park for 26 years. I worked there longer than that, but 26 years in consecutive years. And uh, I was in there five days a week, and sometimes on the weekend, one of the days on the weekend, either Saturday or Sunday. And I would be in there from any time after five in the morning till sometimes eight at night before I got out of there. And I, at any point, did not see a shortage of wolves. Algonquin Park has about 150 wolves in it, and uh, we think there may be, at the most optimistic, twice that number um, outside the park in the immediate vicinity. So you're talking something like 500 
animals, which would make it one of the most endangered uh, canids in the world. And when he starts giving you these figures, like there's 150 wolves, you know, yeah. left on the east side of the park. Yeah. Well, he can take that back to Toronto and tell that to every naturalist that lives there and sell it probably for a big price. I don't care. Do as he wishes. But he certainly won't sell that product in, in this part of the country. Need some ideas of in the park and where things are. And Support hunting and trapping of the wolves at all? Um, I support hunting and trapping in general. I don't support hunting and trapping of, of wolves in in this area because, as I said, the, the population is uh, is small, isolated, and, and threatened. And this is uh, this is an atypical population too. In that, uh, through the research, we found that this is. Um, uh, not the um, not the gray wolf, but a subspecies of the red wolf, and so it, it needs protection here. So I don't I don't uh, support that. Hi guys. So I have to it's okay. chat for a bit. How yeah. are you? Fine, thank you. Yeah, we were uh, we got tipped by the, the people from the Morgan's house. Yes. We should step by here to see if we could find out how to canoe. that I've been saving, different kinds, for uh, a guy had asked me, he does uh, fly fishing. Oh, right, yeah. And he was looking for some fur to use for making his flies. Right. So, like, there's beaver and uh, a bit of fish or otter. Uh, here's a bit of, uh, from a wolf that I've done for a friend of mine. Here's a fox, piece of fox. So if he can use... use There's a, a piece from a South Park. <laughs> yeah. Interesting enough, you're a South Park fan. <laughs> I would say they're pretty healthy and, and according to the numbers that I've been given through ministry staff and people that were involved with the collaring that was going on this past winter, uh, there's a healthy uh, wolf population out there, and uh, as long as their food supply uh, will be abundant, uh, I can see them uh, thriving pretty good. They're a population we need to watch. That's what a spe species of special concern means. Uh, and uh, in Algonquin Park, in particular, we know that the population is is uh, is not um, secure. You know, there's been significant population declines in the last decades uh, and the population modeling shows that they're very vulnerable to human-caused mortality. Um, uh, and th the real point, I think, is that we have to learn to not wait until something is almost extinct before we start to do something. I mean, that, frankly, is the management we have today in Ontario. Um, the argument is we don't need to do anything because they're not, they're not on uh, the death's doorstep yet. And so we're not going to do anything. And um, it's a lot more effective, cost-effective, uh, and reasonable to act now rather than wait till things get really bad. Uh, do you think the Algonquin Park wolf is endangered? Absolutely not. I'm. I'm. I would. I'm not even sure it's at. It's potentially at risk. That as soon as we get into that that sort of question. We get into the scientific evidence that people want to point to to try to make the case for endangerment or risk or something. I, w I, I suppose I would be go I'd be willing to go as far as to agree with the with the Kosiwik, uh, present Kosiwik status, uh, which is species of special concern. Um, because one of the categories that they've decided to, or one of the the uh, 
attributes that, that, that they have to ask questions about is the, is the potential for future change if, if things continue the way they are to put the species at risk or in some other category of endangerment. And if human land use alterations and pressures from human land use continue to increase um, in that part of central Ontario and, and further north and so forth, um, sure, then given that, I could reasonably make the prediction that there's the species or that that particular form of canid is uh, is potentially at risk. So it's safe to say that the eastern wolf within Algonquin Park is not endangered. No, it's um, just as I said, one part of a larger population. There's probably 200 to 300 animals within the park. They are breeding with animals to the west and the north. Um, and as long as there isn't, as I said, a lot of development to the north of the park to cut off that connectivity, then um, we're optimistic about the, the future of the wolves in the park. Pretty, uh, pretty spectacular, isn't it? Yeah. Do you think the Algonquin Park wolf is endangered? No, I don't think it's endangered. Um, it certainly, I suppose, could be considered in some ways a threatened species because it depends on its prey and its habitat to remain intact. Um, right now, the habitat is still continuous in its range pretty well, but the prey species certainly are changing. It seems through um, all the evidence that this wolf was more southern originally and moved north with forest being cleared and white-tailed deer moving north as well. It is, from all accounts, a deer specialist. But in the range where it's found currently, the forest habitat is maturing and becoming less prime for white-tailed deer, which do like more open, younger growth situations. And there certainly is lots of evidence that deer have declined in the last 60, 70 years. Now, there's been a bit of resurgence in numbers the last uh, decade or so, but still overall they're down from what they were 50, 60, 70 years ago. So it seems likely that this eastern Canadian wolf, this, this uh, new taxon, um, may be responding to uh, a decrease in, in prey numbers. A major mistake they made when they, uh, when they put this uh, ban on hunting wolves in these three townships here. Up to that point, yes, I agree, I mentioned it earlier, that there was the odd wolf shot here and there. But I'll tell you, since that took place, I know people that hunt wolves that would have normally never probably taken the gun out of the house during the winter months. But it gave them a challenge and they used it. And, uh, you know, this, this is what's happening. They probably are losing more wolves now than they ever did. Now they put a moratorium on here. Uh, what good is it? Nobody claims these for food. So I mean if that wolf dies, he's dead. If they find him, they've got a bunch of bones to look at. But what happened or where the, where the problem came from, they'll never know. I mean, people are f literally fed up with bureaucrats today. And, I mean, it's not only in the wolf situation, we're getting that from every angle. It's just one bureaucrat leaves and two more pounds in on some other issue. So, people kind of take matters in their own hands and, and look after these things. <coughs> yeah. I mean, myself personally, I mean, if I'm hunting in November in the, in the where I hunt White Mountain area, and I see a wolf chasing a deer, what do you think I'm going to shoot at? Uh, I wouldn't want to venture a guess. Well, <laughs> it'll be the one coming behind. Yeah. This is my attitude now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, no. Uh, this is what's going to put what happened. This is a lot of hunters here. Yeah. You know. So people, are, like you mentioned, normally wouldn't shoot the wolves because there, there's no value for them to do so. Are doing so now is more of a like a political statement almost a statement of uh, they That's feel. Right. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. There's for a sure. challenge out there for people to feel. Yeah. yeah. Lay it here on the. This is your. That's a 280 conch bear, and uh, weighs 
way it operates. Safeties are on. This one probably needs work on it. That's why it's here. Because it's, uh, and those forks are here. That's your trigger mm -hmm. mechanism. And uh, the safeties are on, so it's not going to do anything. But when the animal comes through, like beaver, most of these are all used underwater, eh? Under, right. Under ice. That's how it. Yeah. And it catches the animal right by the neck, eh? but the safeties are on, and uh, so it didn't. Uh, otherwise, uh, there'd be grooves in the handle right here. Right. These are your 330 Magnum, and it closes right tight. See, they close right tight. There's no, there's no room for air when you're playing around with these, because it'll hold you by your hair. If you got caught by the hair, you you know, unless you pull the hair out by the roots, uh, you're caught. So there's uh, these here. As you can see, you know, there's they won't close right tight. I guess, but these here have the extra welded bars and uh, state of the art. The hunters, uh, being a hunter, I don't think I've yet to have seen you know, uh, a live wolf running through the bush while hunting. And I know there was all, they were saying that it was, you know, a lot of wolves were killed by hunters. I disagree with that. It's, uh, I think it's far and few between. See my boys, they have, uh, there's all different ones that they had made. Like you can see, if you go on that side, there's, Gone fishing, <laughs> gone hunting, and gone trapping, eh? Yeah. <laughs> Was a moratorium of, on the hunting and trapping of wolves in the 39 townships around the park justified in your mind? Um, at the time, I would say no. The, the reason I'm saying no is because it was, my recollection was that it was argued that it was required from a population conservation perspective. It is true that individual wolves were being killed in the region of Round Lake and so forth when they followed the deer outside the park. There was not much evidence at the time that the deaths of those individual wolves necessarily had population dynamical consequences for wolves in the region. One could say that it was justified, and, and I, I'm quite certain the environmentalists would take this perspective from the so-called precautionary approach point of view. You know, that we can't wait until we have evidence of negative effects to act. So from that perspective, I can't disagree with it. That wasn't necessarily part of the argument at the time. The case was made that this was linked to, or that these deaths would, were, were the cause of the decline of wolves, at least on the eastern side of the park. Though in much of that literature I talked about earlier, you know, the popular literature, it was never, it was never clear that what we were talking about was the east side of the park and not the whole park and, and, and so on and so forth. These important details are rather glossed over depending on which side of the argument. Uh, the proponents uh, were on. I think the decision was made on the grounds that one could arrest the decline of the the, the uh, uh, purported decline of wolves in the park by stopping the source of mortality. Because that that very quickly became an article of faith for some uh, for proponents of the moratorium and indeed the buffer around the park, where I think the serious scientific community. Uh, accepted it as a testable hypothesis. So, and this is where some of the rifts then began between sort of the, the views of some of the environmental groups who wish the scientists would just get on side and agree that this was bad, and the scientists who were prepared to say, uh, no, I, we, it's not our job to quote unquote get on side. Um, we have, to, there's, there, we have to examine the situation and embrace the uncertainty 
and propose solutions to reduce that uncertainty and learn about the situation. But to put a, a ban on hunting wolves, a total ban, in the heart of a major deer yard like this, this is a major deer yard here. I'm sure uh, uh, Mr. Thompson there would, knows very aware of that. He's been around here and sees it mm -hmm. day in and day out. Like, I mean, it's absolute stupidity. Like, I mean, they're trying to, they're trying to raise deer, but if they're going to raise wolves in that same pen, it don't work. Like, I mean, the issue is we, we have a real biological problem um, and we're looking for a way to solve it. And in our society, we tend to look for a cost-effective way uh, to solve problems. And uh, the most cost-effective way is simply to manage uh, the the, uh, the activity that's having the, the biggest impact. Um, uh, you know, the single largest source of mortality is hunting and trapping death. It uh, outweighs everything else combined. So uh, there isn't much value in going around looking for other things we can tweak in the ecosystem. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's, you know, this is one of the rare conservation biology um, problems that are actually quite simple to solve. What the government decided to do I think fell short of the ideal from a scientific perspective because what what has happened now is that proponents of the buffer no matter what happens will always believe it worked and the other side will always believe it wasn't necessary no matter what happens now and we won't ever be able to actually effectively measure the effect of that buffer what is in place now and, and, and has been is a, a ministry project to try to measure whether there's a change in some aspects of the wolf population from before to after the buffer was in place. And that project's ongoing and we'll have to wait for the data. Worse, the ministry has done what the ministry does on occasion, which is go back into a shell, do the study largely internally, they designed it internally, they didn't engage the competing interests in the process. My biggest fear is that as good as the science will be, I have faith in the guys who are doing it. I read the proposal, it was an excellent proposal, my biggest criticism was that it's all internal. And when the results do come out, the public will have, probably have the same mistrust about it because it was done as an internal government science project that they had no participation in, they have no ownership of, and they probably won't trust it any better than they trusted the previous lot of data. There's a lot more information has to be uh, handed out through the local communities where if you're doing any research work, they, the, they have to be involved. The local groups have to be involved. You gotta make every effort uh, because you hear negative information coming from these groups doesn't mean when you leave that driveway, well, I'm not going back there anymore because they're totally against on what I want to do. i got to find somebody else. No, that's not the proper way to do it. You, you take that information in account with whatever else you accumulate, and then you sit down and say, okay, maybe I was wrong. That's what's wrong with 90% of the people. They won't admit when they make a mistake, they won't admit that they've made a mistake. Mm -hmm. So, and the poor wolf is actually the one that's uh, going to be on the tail end of the stick. It would have been a wonderful opportunity, for example, to take uh, people from the Wildlands League and put them as spotters to count wolf tracks in the same plane with people from the Hunters and Trappers Associations. And then they own the data. And when, and when the study's done, they can't say, oh, well, we don't trust the data, or the government did it, or, you know, well, that, you know, one side will say, well, the government's in the hip pocket of those environmentalists, and the other side will say, ah, oh, the government's in the hip pockets of, of uh, the hunters and trappers, you know, and, and, and not, not, neither end will end up actually trusting what's done anyway. But, if, but, if you, but in participatory management, right, you, shut that, you shut that door down. They can't say later, they don't have a basis for it. They own that data too. They were part of the process that arrived at an answer. So they either don't trust themselves 
or they have to accept the answers. And that's how you that's how you grapple with that uncertainty. Is participatory management messy? You bet it is. But I think it's I think it's a damn sight better than the alternative. So these are our grouse droppings? Those are roughed grouse droppings, yeah. A bit like porcupines, the porcupines are shorter, squatter, and generally darker brown. I'll see lots of those too up here. Twenty-two turtles down below sunning themselves right now in two logs. So even though these, these groups have polar extremes to them, there still is overlap in the middle where you do have some elements of, of each group that share common values. And that is the appreciation of, of, of the wilderness and things wild. Uh, overall though, the, uh, the two groups do remain, the nucleus of each group remains at some distance to each other. Although at the extremes of each group there certainly is overlap and hopefully through time that overlap will, will, will build and uh, then, the, then the, uh, uh, there'll be less friction between uh, groups in the future. Whether that happens or not, just I suppose time will tell. Well, the, 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 view of the, uh, well, the common view of the wolf would be it's part of a Concord Park. The wolf would be part of a Concord Park. It's part of the history and part of nature and part of the heritage of a Concord Park. No, there isn't a common value that everyone shares. Like Bob had mentioned earlier here, uh, yes, uh, the urban people probably enjoy to go out there and listen to their wolf howl. I don't begrudge them that. Go up there and they can listen there all they want. Most groups, no matter where they where they sit on, on the issues, uh, to some degree, at least, the, 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 the animals as as. Uh, representative of wilderness, a wild species. That's why some people love them, and that's why some people hate them. The main conflict is, I think, just perception. Like everyone's got to come to a, a neutral understanding about the wolves, and uh, I guess just out of, out of their other way of thinking. Like the wolves killing my cows, no, we got to protect the wolves, there's only three or four left. So, like, everyone's got to come to one common understanding of uh, what the wolves are. Do you think there's a particular view of the wolf or a common value that all interest groups share? That's, uh, I don't even know if I could answer that one. Is it even like a natural beauty? So I guess, maybe, yeah. But is that with everybody? Sure, everybody's fascinated with animals. Yeah. I guess, uh, yeah, that could be it, just the natural beauty of them. If there, if, while there isn't a common value about wolves per se that I think the different camps could come together on. I think the different camps probably could come together on that issue. That regardless of what you do in that outdoors, 